You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Josephine Bagan, a graduate student at Yale University, where she studies under Peter van Belkum in the astronomy department. She is the lead author on a new paper that uses the James Webb Space Telescope to study evidence of very early, massive galaxy formations. Josephine Bagan, welcome to the program. Thank you. <laughs> Studying the universe's earliest galaxies has proven, especially with the advent of the James Webb Space Telescope, has proven to have presented a lot of mysteries. And one of these mysteries is how fast galaxies apparently formed up in the early universe. So these very early galaxies that you're studying, what sets them apart? And what are they like in comparison to the mature galaxies that we see from our perspective in space right now? Right, so we detected these very massive galaxies in the early universe roughly a year ago. And my research has been focusing on what they look like and how actually how big are they. And it's very interesting that when we think about massive, we think about big and it's like in terms of size, but actually we've been finding that these are actually really small. Th these galaxies are roughly 10 times smaller than the Milky Way today but they have the same amount of stellar mass. So that means if you think about the Milky Way with all its stars and gas, but you shrink it to 10 times smaller, that's what you should think about when you think about these galaxies. Somehow the early universe likes to create massive, but very small galaxies. So these compact galaxies that are massive, but small in size, what exactly is making up the mass? Is it just is it just like a, a super cluster or something like that where the stars are just compacted much closer in? Right. So we actually don't know yet what it consists of. In this research, we assumed that it consists only of stars. And that's why we obtained these super high stellar masses. But you're right. Maybe there is a black hole in the center and then the mass could be wrong. Then we have to do our calculations again. <laughs> But we, we still need spectra to confirm whether the light that we see, the light that we see is very red. And we know two things. It could either be massive stars that create this red light, or it's a black hole in the center with some dust around it that can re-radiate in the infrared. And these are two options and we still don't know which one of it is. But if we assume it's only stars, then we can create these super massive galaxies, which are very interesting because they are very challenging to form in the galaxy formation models. Yeah, there they are. Now, what do they look like? I mean, do they resemble the galaxies we're familiar with? I mean, do they show spiral structures or elliptical structures? So so what do these, these, these early galaxies look like? Right, so when we look at the images, if we look at the images only, we basically only see blobs. We see a few pixels and everything is blended together. So unfortunately, we don't see beautiful spiral arms or anything like that, like in the present day universe. But our codes are very good at determining the light profiles of these images. So we can determine if the stars are more concentrated to the center or if it's more equally spread out. And that's what, it, what we try to determine when we fit profiles to the images. And that's what we call the SIRSIC index. And then another thing that we really try to determine is the size. So like I said already, the size was very small. We find it to be roughly 10 times smaller than the Milky Way. But then let's think more about this structure. So we shouldn't think about these objects as big, beautiful, smooth ellipticals or perfectly thin disk spirals because the universe is very young and it didn't have time to create these, these structures yet. It's rather more messy and clumps are falling in. These galaxies are merging with other galaxies. And there are filaments of gas floating into the galaxy. So yeah, it's actually a very, it's a very messy structure. They're very small and they're very dense. That's basically what you should think about. <laughs> that's interesting because that's going to yield clues on galaxy formation, right? In other words, you're, you're seeing baby galaxies that have not yet matured to anything that we're familiar with. 
and that they're just they're could you call them proto galaxies um no they're not proto galaxies they actually are already pretty massive some of these stellar masses are the same as the milky way today but yeah how they formed and that's that has been a hot topic lately because we don't know how they formed and we were definitely not expecting to see these galaxies so early on with these high stellar masses. Because in our current model of galaxy formation, we think that after some time after the Big Bang, we form these small structures first. And then these smaller structures, they merge with other small structures and they create this bigger structure. And that's what we call the hierarchical structure formation or bottom-up structure formation. So yeah, we shouldn't expect to see big galaxies or let's rephrase that, massive galaxies in the early universe. We expect to only see small clumps of low mass galaxies, basically. So they were very surprising. Interesting. High mass. So also looking at this galaxies this early, is it possible that these could be made up of, of like population three stars that we've been looking for the very earliest stars is is it possible that that's what we're looking at here is is very massive very early types of stars that populate the early universe or is this not quite to that level yeah that's a that's a good question well we know that after some time after the big bang the universe was made up of hydrogen and helium which we call primordial gas and we know that these were the first atoms that formed and then once they clump together, they can form clouds and then these clouds, they can collapse under gravity and form the first stars. So that's, we, we think, or at least we know for sure that th these were the first stars that were born in the universe. But unfortunately, we have never found them directly before, even though we've been searching for these stars for decades. And indeed, I think some research has been shown that you could maybe find these types of stars, these population three stars, in outskirts of massive galaxies. Unfortunately, in these galaxies that we're talking about here, we cannot see any signatures yet. But I know that some people have been looking for these population three stars in JWST data, and it's been one of the science goals of, of the James Webb Space Telescope. No. With these early galaxies, say that they are early stars like that, could we expect to see higher supernova rates in these in these very distant redshifted galaxies? Yeah, absolutely. We we're talking about very high star formation rates, and that's why we can also expect high supernova rates too. And in our Milky Way, I think roughly once every 50 years or so, there's a supernova going off. And with these high star formation rates in the massive galaxies, we could expect this rate to be a lot higher, maybe once every year. So in theory, we could we could detect a supernova going off in these galaxies. But that means that we have to point at it all the time. And in practice, I don't think that's possible, but it would be super useful because it could be one of the first signatures of a population three star as well. That's a heck of a signature. It's a population three star exploding. <laughs> a very red shifted supernova. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just mind boggling how early this is in the infant universe. And we can see it. <laughs> and there it is. And it's it's definitely new territory. Now, some people talk about a crisis in cosmology and maybe the universe is older than we thought or something like that. But that's not really what your research says, right? Right. That's a good question. Some people have been claiming that the universe should be older to form these massive structures because, like I explained before, we have this Lambda CDM model, which is telling you we, we start with small objects first and then we can build up bigger galaxies over time. And now this group a year ago found massive galaxies in the early universe. So they're young, but they're very massive, which tells you that they must have formed their stars in a very efficient way. So some way there is this process that we might not understand yet that is able to create these very massive galaxies in the early universe. I think it's rather a problem of understanding the processes better than claiming that the universe should be older. Because if you're using a different model and you're saying the universe is twice as old, you're also running into problems because you're not able to explain 
for example, how groups are made or galaxy clusters or other observables. So yeah, there, there, is, there is a problem and we still are figuring it out. <laughs> but saying that the universe must be older is, is not, we, we don't know yet. But I, I personally don't believe the universe should be older. It really would go against a bunch of other observational stuff. But at the same time, though, the idea of the universe being more efficient at galaxy formation in the early universe is amazing in its own mm -hmm. right, right? Yeah, exactly. So we never expected this efficiency before. So when we when we talk about galaxy formation, we can we can we have basically a very precise model that describes how massive a galaxy can be. So we know that at, at a given time after the Big Bang, we can calculate with our dark matter model and the amount of ordinary matter, uh, which we call baryons, we can calculate basically an upper limit of the stellar mass of a galaxy for every given time after the Big Bang. And these galaxies that we just found are basically on the edge of what is physically possible. They require 100% efficiency of converting gas into stars. So basically what you can visualize is a huge halo and there's gas in it and you need to convert all your gas into stars to create these high stellar masses. And that's very different from the present day universe where, for example, the Milky Way, only roughly 20% of everything in the halo is converted in stars. Most of the gas is still floating around in what we call the, the circumgalactic medium. So it's something that has opened our eyes. This efficiency, some people say this is impossible very unrealistic but other people say wait maybe the universe likes this efficiency and maybe we can form from these filaments or clouds collapsing we can actually expect 100 percent efficiency so yeah we're learning a lot from these new data sets <laughs> And they're exquisite. I mean, at no time in the history of astronomy has data like, like this been available. And is it actually difficult to work with, with data this good? Um, I would say it's not necessarily difficult to work with the data. I mean, the data is better than before. So if you look at your image, you have a better resolution than what you would have 10 years ago. But of course, everyone is trying to find answers to very difficult problems and you, you don't want to make any mistakes, especially because you're privileged to work with the data. And yeah, I think that's the, the hardest task to, to, um, to do good <laughs> with the data that we have because we spend so much money on this telescope, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it, it, I mean, there haven't been any failures lately. And just watching what's coming from James Webb, is just amazing that that telescope that we waited for how many decades for and now it works yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually exceeding our expectations instead of having what happened with the Hubble telescope and all of a sudden we find an optical problem but that's that that's not happening anymore we're we're very successful with it now obscured supermassive black holes possibly mimicking galaxies how do you tell the difference between an actual very early galaxy and an obscured supermassive black hole Right. So that's actually something that we have looked into a lot with this research. The first step when you detect objects is always to look at the color. So what we do is we measure flux in different wavelengths, and then we try to fit a curve to our data points. And then we try to understand what we see from that curve. But unfortunately, like I said before, both massive galaxies with massive stars in them can create a similar curve as a black hole with a dust cloud around it. So how do we tell which one of the two it is? That's actually a bigger problem and that's something that we've looked into. First of all, we are going to get spectra for these sources and then we can actually tell whether the light came from massive stars or whether it came from dust. But another thing is a massive black hole will look like a point source in your image. So that's similar as when you look at a star, that's also a very small point in your image. 
Well, galaxies tend to be slightly bigger and they tend to show some structure. And that's the difference between a supermassive black hole with a dust cloud around it that creates this red light or a galaxy that has some structure in there. And in this research, what we did is we tried to resolve this structure and we were able to do so for nine of the 13 galaxies. So that means the light that we observed could not have been only coming from a black hole. So at least we know that there is a galaxy there. It could be that there is a little bit of black hole in the center, but we still don't know. That's what really why we need the spectra that will really help us resolve these problems. And those spectra, actually, they will come soon, somewhere in the next year. I'm very excited. We're going to see what these objects really are. So that's very exciting. Ooh, that is exciting. I wasn't aware that, that you were going to uh, get spectra that quickly. So there is a chance that we are going to understand this stuff a lot more clearly in a very short amount of time, right? Right. So yeah, there is this whole tension with the cosmology and we're, we might be able to solve it. Because if all the sources are dominated by black holes, then we can really release the tension. But if they are actually supermassive galaxies, then yeah, we, we need to go back to our model and understand why the universe was so efficient in forming stars. I think it's absolutely fascinating, just the idea of, of a sort of efficiency to the early universe like that, approaching 100% efficiency is just mind boggling in that, how did the universe do that? <laughs> <laughs> and especially since it, it got really messy later on, <laughs> it, it's not as efficient today. And it's just one of those great mysteries of the universe. Well, Josephine, thank you for joining us today. And I hope you'll come back as this research develops and you learn more, especially with the spectra. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks for uh, inviting me. <laughs> Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. <laughs>